Hello, I'm Elizabeth Lucas. I am a member of the AAP Council on Children with Disabilities. I am a physician in the Complex Healthcare Clinic at Nationwide Children's Hospital, and I'm board certified in pediatric infectious disease. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking about caring for children with complex medical conditions during the COVID-19 pandemic. I have no financial relationships to report, uh, but I do think a more important disclosure is that um, all the information I'll be presenting today is up to date at the time of this recording. But as everyone is well aware, uh, the situation is uh, ever changing and this information may need updating within the next few days to weeks. So I'd like to first identify who children with medical complexity are, discuss some special considerations during the COVID-19 pandemic, and then provide some strategies about how to prepare your practice and clinic for the COVID-19 pandemic, and some other strategies for how to work with and support families during this time. And then lastly, provide you with some tools and resources. So children with medical complexity are a large group of kids, but they are defined as having multiple significant chronic health problems that affect multiple organ systems and result in functional limitations. They often have high healthcare need or utilization and often the need for or use of medical technology. They account for about one to 5% of children in practice. And if you need more information on that, I would direct you to the excellent resource, the AAP Council on Children with Disabilities Clinical Report, Recognition and Management of Medical Complexity. So some special considerations during the COVID-19 pandemic to consider about these patients is that many of them are medically fragile. Uh, experienced clinicians already know that viral illnesses that cause a minor or moderate respiratory illness in typically developing children can present as very severe disease in our medically fragile and complex group. That's often because they have underlying lung disease or that they have tracheostomies, another risk factor for respiratory disease. Additionally, these kids oftentimes have impaired communication, making it difficult to recognize early symptoms um, of a prodrome of an illness, which we know has been described during this COVID-19 pandemic. Lastly, they have a lot of exposures to healthcare systems in many ways, and some patients travel between different healthcare systems. So they have a lot of epidemiological links and can be exposed for many different reasons. Lastly, they may be entirely reliant on caregivers, which is another thing we need to consider in the equation of who takes care of them, because caregivers themselves may be at high risk for a severe disease with the COVID-19 infection. Clinically, we have some good information coming out of China, getting published rapidly. Um, so I've presented a few of the papers that I was able to find so far. As you can see, most of them are small uh, case reports or case series, ranging anywhere from nine to about 171 patients. And then there's one, patient, one paper that was published this week in pediatrics. Uh, that's a larger cohort of more than 2,100 patients. Uh, but really that paper had very limited clinical data and it was much more of an epidemiological study. So reviewing these papers, we did get some hints that some of our patients who have complex medical conditions are experiencing um, higher, more severe disease than their typically developing peers. The first paper is by uh, Zia, and you'll see I've commented, highlighted it in red, that um, in their case series of 20 patients, seven patients were described as having a history of congenital or acquired disease. They didn't provide any specific details about what those conditions were, but at the end of their paper, they did comment that they thought those children with medical complexity would be more susceptible to the COVID-19 infection, given that they saw seven out of 20 patients um, did meet that criteria. The last paper um, by Lou et al. in New England Journal from yesterday um, was a case series of 171 patients, and it described three patients with pre-existing conditions, uh, hydronephrosis, leukemia, and intussusception. Those three patients uh, did go on to require ICU and invasive mechanical ventilation, 
unfortunately there was one death in a 10 month old male with the, the pre-existing condition of intussusception, suggesting that yes, these patients are going to experience severe disease um, as expected. So with that in mind, thinking about how to prepare your practice and clinic to address this pandemic, I first want to strongly advise that you get to know your local resources. And we'll be talking about some of the resources I'm utilizing here in Ohio, um, but obviously this is gonna vary based on where you're located. And it's also going to vary based on what stage in the pandemic your community is experiencing. My first recommendation is to reach out to your public health department. Uh, with my infectious disease background, I've always considered the public health department as a great place to get your immunizations and excellent for um, managing all of our reportable diseases. But of course, they do so much more. At the beginning of our pandemic, we reached out to them, our local um, health department, and they were able to furnish us with a pandemic guide that um, provided instructions for everything ranging from where to find green free or reduced cost meals, to managing utility issues that may come up during this time, to providing recommendations for shelters if housing becomes an issue. So they really do have a lot of great local resources. Secondly, I will recommend and refer you guys to your local hospital or health system to um, get connected regarding testing. That will be very important. And then also as resources get reallocated, they may be able to help assist with other um, issues that are coming up with our population. And then lastly, I will encourage you to get connected with your local school districts. Again, uh, many groups, depending on where you are in your stage of pandemic, are already seeing that school has been canceled uh, for either weeks or indefinitely at this point. Um, so those resources are getting reallocated as well. Many of the schools around here are still gonna be providing free school lunch and sometimes breakfast, and perhaps some in-home instruction and perhaps some therapy with, again, those reallocated resources. One of the big things that a lot of people are thinking about and talking about is canceling and rescheduling appointments when it comes to our complex population. The AAP recently released a comment this week where they recommended that you continue seeing newborns, infants, and young children due to immunizations, but that it was reasonable to start prioritizing which necessary visits. Um, this can give you some flexibility uh, with uh, designing your schedule to better space out your patients to again promote all of those social distancing uh, properties that we're all discussing, hearing a lot about. I also encourage to develop a plan for sick visits if you haven't already. Um, as we've discussed already, the patients um, that have complex needs oftentimes have respiratory symptoms. and Really, they need to be screened before they present to your clinic in the event that they would qualify and need COVID-19 testing. Um, if they present to your clinic and later are diagnosed with COVID-19, unfortunately, your whole staff could be stuck in quarantine, um, which brings me to my next point about thinking about protecting your labor force, because you need everyone to stay there so that you can continue to serve your patients and your population. And then lastly, uh, I think one of the silver linings that's gonna come out of this difficult time is the uh, widespread use of telehealth options. Um, when Ohio became a state of emergency after that declaration, our state board actually relaxed all the measures around telemedicine and determined that it could be used in place of in-person visits as long as there's proper documentation and you meet the standard of care with each visit. There are certainly some technological and administrative infrastructure considerations before those get started for you. Um, but if that is too insurmountable for where you are in your practice, you can certainly still conduct a lot of efficient and effective communication via the telephone, and that can count towards um, telehealth appointments as well. 
the medication considerations, um, there are a lot of patients who are concerned about being able to get their, um, their prescriptions. So our experience here in Ohio is that our Medicaid HMOs and state Medicaid have again relaxed some of their rules around first early fill options. So as um, the recommendations from our local governments kind of uh, escalated, um, reducing access to uh, outside facilities more and more, um, this was a great option to get our patients their medication up to seven days early. Um, so that way they didn't have to leave their house for the next month or so. Additionally, we're seeing some extra 90-day overrides um, available on maintenance prescriptions. Uh, I do think it's an important caveat to note that if your patients use a lot of liquid or compounded medications, though their stability tends not to go beyond 30 to 35 days, so they wouldn't be um, comparable for a 90-day override, but if a 90-day is still desirable for you, uh, you could consider switching over to a tablet form of the medication if that's okay with your families. Um, there are some controlled substances that you can prescribe with a 90-day override. Uh, that will probably vary depending on where you are, um, but in our situation, it's still considered an exception at this time. Lastly, some simple things that you can think about that may be useful to your patients is many pharmacies have some delivery services. Um, perhaps switching medications from one pharmacy to another could allow the patients to access them that way. And if that's not available, many pharmacies have drive-throughs so families can pick up medications without having those additional exposure risks in the pharmacy itself. A big topic that's on a lot of people's mind is food insecurity, especially with some of the panic that's been going on. And we've all seen the photos of the empty um, grocery shelves at certain places. Um, and we, our families are certainly feeling that. So again, I would refer you to local school districts about whether they are gonna continue to offer school lunches, potentially even school breakfast for any of your patients who might be feed my mouth. I'd refer you to food banks and you can use this uh, website to find a local food bank for you. Um, have families consider donating if they're looking for um, another way to help their community. It's another good thing to encourage. Um, but I think the big question that most people are gonna hear about is questions around formula. Um, there's definitely been some supply concerns, at least at the front, um, the consumer point. But when we have talked to our DME providers, they have generally ported at this time to have good stock in their warehouses. Um, for our WIC users, we've heard definitely some difficulty with getting access to their particular formula. So we've been counseling our families to anticipate the need to pick up their formula a few days earlier than they normally would, which is generally a good practice, but even more important during this pandemic time. Um, we've been having them call ahead and speaking, communicating directly with pharmacists or cons um, the consumer specialists at grocery stores to discuss their specific need, provide their WIC information, and ask about when deliveries are expected. Many of the grocery stores and pharmacists now have started regulating the sale of the formula, so hopefully that will be um, less of a significant issue as they get their, their, their stores restocked, um, but I know it has definitely been an issue. Um, and then lastly, um, I, if you're in an extenuating circumstance and unable to find stock in your neighborhood or your local area, you can reach out to the formula manufacturers directly or through their representatives. Um, we have heard that they're trying to regulate um, the way their, for their products are being sold a little bit more, and they can certainly try to help out um, in, in difficult circumstances. Lastly, we've heard a lot of concerns about the mental health considerations. Uh, so mental health resources, um, 
some kids get a lot of behavioral support in their schools and with school being out those those issues can become more difficult to manage so i would first encourage that you reach out to your county board of mental health and see what is going to be available for them i think there is going to be a lot more telehealth being coming available and certainly the psychologists and psychiatrists in our area are on their way to working that out if you need something a little bit more immediate, there is this disaster distress helpline that's been set up that you can call or text, uh, and that's through the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. It can also help eventually get you to something more local. The CDC actually has a pretty decent um, guideline for managing stress and anxiety, especially during this specific coronavirus pandemic. And then anecdotally, um, I spent a lot of time with some patients this week, just really thinking about and talking about their pervasive general anxiety. And they're hearing sometimes good information, but processing how, what all that information means for them, this particular individual has been difficult for a lot of families, as well as in, in lovely ways, they are getting involved with social media to stay connected. But in some ways that can also become quite an echo chamber for anxiety. So providing some gentle counseling about managing their exposure to those sort of things and, and thinking through and making a plan for themselves. So as far as our caregivers, as I mentioned earlier, our caregivers may actually be at higher risk for severe disease than their child. Uh, we do have many grandparents who care for children nowadays, and then some parents just tend to be older or may have lung conditions that put them at high risk. This is an opportunity to have them talk about and start working through identifying some contingency plans should the caregiver become ill, require hospitalization, or, or need further assistance, um, whether that's through identifying family members and making a plan for how they're going to take over care. And while it's never my favorite um, topic of conversation with families, um, it is a good opportunity to talk about making sure they have their legal paperwork in order, whether that be for them a will or a power of attorney, necessary paperwork to ensure that their child is cared for should anything take the caregiver away from being able to do it themselves. All right, I have a lot of people to thank who've helped me put together these slides. Uh, certainly, I would like to thank Alex and the AAP Council on Children with Disabilities for providing with this opportunity. Of course, my entire complex healthcare team, and then Dr. Norris, Kayla, our pharmacist, Maddie, our dietitian, and Natalie, our psychologist. That's my information there, should I, anyone desire to email me. Finally, here is a slide of some various resources that I've collected that I hope you can find useful. Should you have further questions, or concerns, I encourage you to reach out to AAP through this email address. Thank you.